So Lord, we thank you that this morning that we had the chance to gather together uh, and to sit under the authority of your word. And so as we look at it this morning, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd open it up to us. We pray that you'd give us understanding, uh, insight. We pray that you'd speak to each of us personally across this church. Uh, build us up and equip us to be your witnesses in the week ahead, we pray. Amen. Well, today uh, we've been remembering with the help of uh, Jim and Hillary, uh, the 47th birthday of this church. But this morning we're also remembering perhaps, and dare I say, an even more important birthday, and that is the birth of God's church. The day when his Holy Spirit came upon his people on the day of Pentecost. This was during uh, what was known as the Festival of Weeks, which occurred 50 uh, days after the Passover festival. And the word Pentecost comes from the Greek word Pentecostos, which means 50. And during the events described in Acts 2, we see that the Holy Spirit came probably on about 120 people, uh, almost twice as many as we get uh, on a Zoom Sunday. But let's remember, shall we, that this did not happen unexpectedly. On the contrary, at the end of Luke's Gospel in chapter 24, verse 48, Jesus reminded all his followers that he had called them to be his witnesses. In other words, to tell people what they had seen, heard and experienced of God so that other people might also believe. But surprisingly at that time, Jesus told them not to go out and start telling people about him, but rather to stay in and to wait. To wait to be clothed with power from on high is how he puts it in Luke 24. So when we read verse one of this morning's passage, and we see that the believers are all together in one place, that means that they are obeying Jesus's command, that they were waiting indeed for the power that he promised them just before he ascended into heaven. And if you were to look back at verse 14 of chapter one of Acts, you'd see that they were all together and that they joined together constantly in prayer. Prayer nearly always precedes a movement of God's spirit, doesn't it? One of the things that the day of Pentecost reminds us of is that if you do anything for God, it's important, isn't it, to start well, uh, generally by praying. It's important always uh, in most things to start well, isn't it? If you're a runner, uh, running in a marathon, for example, one of the worst things you can do is to begin by setting off too quickly. The runners who hit the wall at around 18 miles and run out of energy are generally the ones who have uh, gone off too fast at the beginning. When my brother and I go walking in the mountains, we often find that we have to look at the map and the compass most carefully at the beginning of the walk. So easy to set off on the wrong path by being too casual. And the church we see here began with the best possible start, with prayer and with a movement of God's spirit. But before we dig into this passage, let's remind ourselves, shall we, who the Holy Spirit is. One of the most important things I think to remember about the Holy Spirit is that he is a person, one of the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, as we're encouraged to call them. And that is why the Bible always uses the pronoun he when referring to the Spirit. From time to time, you will hear Christians using the word it when talking about the Holy Spirit. But this is not right. The Holy Spirit is fully God. And just as Jesus encourages us to think of God as our heavenly father, as a person, so too he encourages us to think of God's spirit as a person. It might be helpful if you want to, to reread John chapter 14 this afternoon and, and see how Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit. When I think of the Holy Spirit, I think of him as the presence and the power and the love of God the one who comes alive in our hearts when we believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit enables you and me to feel, to sense and to experience the very presence of God. The Holy Spirit makes God real to us, enables us to have a personal living relationship with God. He fulfills Jesus's promise to be with us until the very end of the age. When you become a Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit turns your body into a temple. In other words, God moves into your heart and he makes himself at home within you. But notice, too, that the Holy Spirit 
always glorifies God. Have a look at verse 11. Here we see that the people looking in to so what was going on heard people declaring the wonders of God. If something is said in the name of the Holy Spirit and it's genuine, it will always glorify God and not the person speaking. If, you, um, if someone says that the Holy Spirit has told them to do something, again, if it's genuine, it won't ever contradict what you read about God in the Bible. In the church where I did my curacy at St Matthew's in Ipswich, a long-standing Christian man began an affair and left his wife of 30 years. When the vicar visited him and challenged him about his behaviour, the man told him that God had told him to leave his wife for the woman that he was now with. Utter nonsense, said the vicar. And of course he was able to say that, wasn't he? Because it contradicts everything we read in scripture. That man's action did not glorify God. Okay, so what can we learn about the Holy Spirit from this passage this morning? You'll be surprised to hear that I think we can learn three things. Firstly, the Holy Spirit is for all people. The Holy Spirit is for all people. As I said earlier, just before Jesus was taken up into heaven, he declared his followers to be his witnesses. Witnesses of all that they had seen of God through knowing him. But witnesses too of what he did and said of taught and taught. Witnesses of his healings and his miracles. Witnesses of the difference that knowing Jesus makes in your life. But despite reminding them that he'd call them to be his witnesses, Jesus told them to wait until they'd received the Holy Spirit before they went out and told people about him. And that's what we're looking at in this morning's passage, the time when they received the Spirit. And so as we remember the birth of Christ church on the day of Pentecost, we also, I think, need to remember that we all need the Holy Spirit. If the first disciples needed him, then you and I do too. And isn't that what is stressed right the way throughout this entire passage? Verse one underlines that they were all together. In verse two, we read that when the Holy Spirit came, he filled the whole house. That he rested on each one of them in verse three and that all of them were filled, verse four. What's more at this time, remember that Jerusalem is also full of people. Some biblical commentators think that there were up to a million Jews thronging the streets of the ancient city. People from nearby countries, as Barbara read to us, Greeks, Egyptians, Libyans, Turks and Italians. The Holy Spirit waited seven weeks to come upon his church. I wonder whether perhaps he waited until Jerusalem was full of people from all these different countries on hand to hear and experience and see and witness uh, God coming upon his church in a big way, as if to underline perhaps that the Holy Spirit is indeed for all people. Perhaps also to remind the disciples of Christ's call uh, in the end of, end of Matthew's gospel to go out and make disciples of all the nations. This week I was uh, rereading a, a great book that uh, I can thoroughly recommend. It's called Gate Crashing, and it's about a group of Christians uh, in Ibiza. Uh, it's called a 24-7 uh, group. And they go out to nightclubs and into the streets uh, looking for people who are drunk or drugged or in need of help after clubbing. One evening they came across a hen party who were all wearing very short red skirts and wearing devil's horns. Two members of the prayer team approached the group and asked the bride-to-be whether they could pray for her and her forthcoming marriage. Amazingly, she agreed. As one of the team began praying, the bride-to-be began to cry. One of her friends rushed over and asked the team, why is she crying? What are you saying to her? The team felt a bit awkward, but the future bride said, it's not her that's making me cry, it's God in her that's touching me. You know, Pentecost reminds us that God and the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is for all people not just for people in the church, but for all people in all the world. Secondly, I think we learn that the Holy Spirit empowers his witnesses. The Holy Spirit empowers his witnesses. When the Holy Spirit came upon his church, Jesus was no longer physically on earth, of course. By then he descended into heaven. I wonder at this point what his followers were thinking, especially after seven weeks of waiting. They probably had many doubts, questions and fears buzzing through their minds, didn't they? How can we carry on without Jesus? Who's going to do all the miracles now that he's gone? How can we begin to do some of the things he did 
Let's face it, none of us can preach like him. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, God filled their hearts with his power, his love and his presence. He overturned their fears and doubts in one day, didn't he? On the day of Pentecost, God proves that he's still amongst his people. And that's true even today, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is still God's presence amongst his people, empowering us to be his witnesses, but also transforming us for the task. Think how the Holy Spirit transformed Peter on the day of Pentecost. In the Gospels, Peter is always the keen one, but also he's a bit full of himself, isn't he? In Matthew 26, 33, for example, he boasts that even if all the other 11 disciples deny Jesus, he never will. And yet Peter went on to deny Jesus three times. He didn't even have the courage to tell a simple servant girl that he was a follower of Christ. But on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit has come upon him, Peter speaks boldly to a crowd of thousands, telling them about their need for Jesus. Verse 14. After my first sermon, a man asked me if I knew how hard the pews were. But after Peter's first sermon, 3,000 people became Christians, verse 41. Just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus promised his followers that they would be filled with the Spirit, but filled, he said, for a purpose, so that they could be powerful witnesses for him. And that's still the purpose of Christ's church even today, isn't it? Our calling is still to be powerful witnesses for Jesus Christ, which is why we need God's Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. And let's remember that the Holy Spirit isn't just interested in the wild, wacky people in our church. He wants to empower all of us, even normal people too. He wants to work in everybody, albeit in different ways. God wants to fill all of us with his spirit so that we can all be his witnesses. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, Paul encourages his church to be transformed by the renewing of their minds, as he puts it. To be transformed here means to be reformed, to change, to be reshaped by the presence and the power and the love of God. But again, God transforms us for a purpose, doesn't he? Jesus has given each of us a special job to do for him, to tell other people that he is alive so that, that they can meet him and begin a relationship with him that literally lasts for eternity. Our job is still to be his witnesses, to tell people what we have seen of Christ, to talk about the difference he makes in our lives and to show them what it means to follow him by the way we live, to show them what he is like by the things that we do. But we can only be powerful witnesses for Christ if we're full of God. And that's why God wants to fill each of us with his spirit, equipping us, empowering us and transforming us to be his witnesses. So if you're shy, the Holy Spirit wants to make you bolder. If you're timid when it comes to speaking to people about Jesus, the Holy Spirit will encourage you. If your heart has grown hard over the years, the Holy Spirit wants to soften you. If you've become me, he can make you more generous. If you've become bitter, he wants to release you and make you more forgiving. If you're anxious, ask him and the Holy Spirit will give you his peace. If you get angry easily, Again, pray for his patience. God wants to empower and equip us to be his witnesses. So in our personal prayer times in the week ahead, let's keep asking God to refill us with his spirit. Ask him to transform you and to give you what you lack. Ask others perhaps if it would be helpful to pray with you and for you so that you might be refreshed and be renewed. Jesus calls us to be his witnesses, but God always enables us to do what he calls us to do. And it's through the ministry of his Holy Spirit that he empowers and transforms you and me to be his witnesses. Lastly, we see that the Holy Spirit is always slightly mysterious. The Holy Spirit is always slightly mysterious. So far, as I've said, we've seen that we all need the Spirit and that the Spirit empowers us. But let's also recognise that there will always be something mysterious about the way the Holy Spirit works through us and within us. And as we see here, that's always been the case. In verse 6, God-fearing Jews are bewildered, we're told. We're told in verse 7 that everyone is utterly amazed. In verse 8, they ask each other, how can this be happening? 
In verse 12, the onlookers are amazed and perplexed, we're told. What does this mean, they ask one another. With any real act or movement of the Holy Spirit, there's always an element of mystery that we can never fully explain or understand. But to me, an element of mystery often authenticates that something is the work of the Spirit. Although the Bible reveals and teaches us a lot about the nature and the workings of God, we do also need to accept that if God is God, he will always work in, way, he will always work in ways that are beyond our understanding. In the Bible, the Hebrew word that was used for spirit is the word ruach, which means wind. And this is a good description, isn't it, of the Holy Spirit, because as with wind, we cannot see God's spirit but we can see the powerful effects that he has on situations and on the people he touches. When people looked at what was happening on the day of Pentecost, they could see the effect of the Holy Spirit on, that was having on people. They could hear God speaking through these very ordinary men and women, and they too were perplexed and wondered what it all meant, verse 12. But although we ourselves may find the work of the Holy Spirit perplexing or even at times unnerving, although we may, <clears throat> what we see may leave us with many questions, it's nonetheless what the Holy Spirit says and does in our lives that makes us fruitful for God. And therefore we need to learn to live with an element of mystery and not fully understanding. As humans, we naturally resist the work of the Spirit, don't we? Perhaps because some of us like to be in control. Maybe it's because he might ask us to take a risk. Maybe he might move us out of our comfort zones or worse still, make us surrender our plans and agendas. But it is the mysterious ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that enables even you and me to be God's witnesses and to believe that we can be fruitful for him. And let's remember that the Holy Spirit didn't stop working on the day of Pentecost. If you look right through the book of Acts, you see that he carries on working through his church. The Holy Spirit kept empowering Peter's preaching, for example. If you were to cast your eye over uh, verse 3 of chapter 4, you see that his preaching resulted in another 2,000 people coming to Christ. In chapter 6, verse 5, we, we read about Stephen, a man who is described as being full of the Spirit right until the very last stone. In Acts 9, we see the Spirit work through Peter in the healing of Ananias in verse 34 and in the rising of Dorcas from the dead, verse 40. In chapter 11, Barnabas is described as a man who's full of the Spirit in verse 24 and who brought a great number of people to the Lord. And then finally, in, in Acts 13, verse 2, the Holy Spirit showed up in yet another prayer meeting and asked Barnabas and Saul to take the gospel onto a new continent. You know, it's good that we remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost each year. But it's even better if we remember that the Holy Spirit keeps empowering and transforming us to be his witnesses, even today. A few years ago, we were praying before a service, and I felt that God gave me a picture for somebody. It was rather curious. It was a fish in a clear polythene bag in water, but the bag was in a tropical fish tank. I didn't really understand what it meant, but I nonetheless gave it out to the church during the service. And as I did, I felt God saying, there's a new person here who is finding it difficult to fit into this church, but I'm giving them this picture because when you buy a new tropical fish, you have to put it into the tank in a plastic bag and wait for a few hours before you open the bag. Otherwise, the, the, the water will be at a different temperature and the sudden change of temperature of the water will kill the fish. After the service, a relatively new lady came up to me and told me that she thought the picture was for her. She just joined our church and she said that in her previous church, she'd been at the epicenter of everything that was going on. So she was finding it hard to fit in with us because she didn't have much to do. The picture reassured her that God was in this time of transition and that she needed to be patient for her own good. She went on to be on the leadership team, head up cap and work in a night shelter. So it's good, isn't it, that we're remembering what the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost. But it's even more important that you and I remind ourselves that this is what God wants to do every day of the year, because the Holy Spirit is indeed for all people, and he still empowers Christians to be his witnesses, 
even though the Holy Spirit will always be a bit mysterious. Amen.